In the ancient year of 2016, there existed a game called Paragon, an ambitious multiplayer online battle arena, MOBA for short, that pit two teams of five against each other. Each team chose from a roster of unique heroes, each with their own weaknesses and strengths, to fight for control of a lane. In order to dominate a lane, the player must destroy two defensive towers and an inhibitor in order to get to the enemy team's core. The first team to destroy the opponent's core was the victor. In extremely broad strokes, that is the core gameplay of most MOBA titles. There's more to it than that, and if you've ever played a MOBA, then you're probably pretty frustrated at that oversimplification, but we will explain more as the video keeps going. Paragon was unique in the 2010s. The first distinction many notice is the camera angle and the sharp visuals. Most MOBA opt for a cartoony look with an isometric camera angle in order to get a wide view of the arena and more strategic control of your lane. Paragon instead chose a third person over the shoulder camera style, more akin to a shooter. The graphics were also super sharp, making heavy use of the particle effects and realistic textures. Paragon had a striking style that clearly separated it from its competitors. The animations of the characters were all clean and smooth, and the attacks were clearly telegraphed to show weight and speed. Another thing that separated Paragon from its competitors was its fast paced, combat centric gameplay. Other MOBAs take gameplay pretty slow and methodical with all the different roles playing their parts till the end. Most MOBA matches can take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour versus Paragon where the 30 minute mark is typically the end of a match. Paragon rewarded players being as hostile as they possibly could be as early as possible by leveling you up faster with enemy kills. The lane roles were more of a suggestion as about halfway through the match, the goal was to completely team wipe your enemy in order to have the map to yourself to push lanes and destroy those towers mentioned earlier. I say all this to bring to light the appeal of Paragon. It was a rapid fire, pretty looking action MOBA where the rules weren't so concrete. It was a lot of fun that was easy to learn and hard to master. And although it had all the same problems other MOBAs do, Paragon was constantly being updated at a blistering pace to fix things and add stuff to keep the game fresh and inviting. A brief look at the competition at the time, the most obvious example was Smite, a third person MOBA that based its characters on different mythologies and employed a cartoony art style. I've probably sunk a couple hundred hours into Smite, but to be honest, it never felt as good as Paragon, even though arguably, Smite is a more polished experience. The combat felt so much better in Paragon, so I kept returning for more. And if you like this video and want to return to my channel for more, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Every single like and subscribe enormously helps out a small creator like myself. The other competition Paragon had to deal with was League of Legends. And yeah, there's really no beating that. <laughs> Paragon had to leverage the fresh camera angle and more realistic graphics to pull the League players over. One strong suit that Paragon had over League was the accessibility. With a tiny roster and shorter gameplay, it was a lot easier to memorize what every character could do and how to counter them. Some would say a small roster is a negative, me not so much. I'd rather a handful of well-crafted characters than a bunch of characters with minor gameplay tweaks. There was one other major enemy to Paragon, that being the developers themselves. See, Paragon was developed by Epic Games, which, funny enough, those guys made the Gears of War games. But they also made another little known game called Fortnite. Fortnite released a little under a year after Paragon, and in that time Paragon made about 20 bucks in revenue, while Fortnite Battle Royale made 1 billion dollars in a year. That second part is not exaggeration. Gears of War 3 had made 100 million dollars in its lifespan, while Fortnite made 10 times that money in one week. Unfortunately for Paragon, Epic Games decided, instead of using their newfound fortune to fund a studio or a team to take care of Paragon, they instead decided to take it around back and mercy kill it. That way, the resources and marketing budget could focus solely on their new cash cow. To be fair, that's a better end to a game than dangling half-dead gameplay and development around on a puppet string. Some stories must come to an end, and a rapid painless death is better than a slow messy one, I suppose. What came after this was pretty cool. They decided to take all of the code and assets and just give it away. 
It was reported to be about $17 million of assets and they just tossed it out for any developer to take hold of and do what they want. And a few projects were announced that were going to utilize these assets. A notable few include Fault, Elder Orb, who was first to the punch, but unfortunately only got about two years of a full release before shutting its servers down. There was also Paragon, the Overprime. This one seemed kind of promising, although I never played it. Getting the official Paragon trademark granted to them seemed to make them have the best shot at being successful, but unfortunately they called it quits about a year into their release too. The last one is what we will be reviewing in this video. The game that seems to be the winner in carrying the torch of Paragon is Predecessor. Developed by Omeda Studios, Predecessor is everything that Paragon was trying to be, with some pretty heavy changes naturally occurring since it's been 6 years since Paragon shut down. Since we're officially talking about the game, we can start delving deeper into what makes this MOBA so special and stop talking in generic language. Upon booting up the game, you're greeted with a pretty sleek and minimal UI. A character with a random skin is pasted dead center, above that being all the different tabs that lead you to various places, one of these tabs being called Heroes. Inside this tab is all these really neatly designed characters for you to unlock and play with. New characters are rotated through a free pool that anyone can use as long as they're in this pool, and you're given one free character for each role that we will discuss later. The rest you have to unlock, either through normal play or by purchasing credits to unlock them. Let's put a pin in that because I want to talk about some of the characters first. You'll notice they're all designed and themed well. Some are, of course, better than others, but by briefly looking at them, you can kind of get a gauge for what they are. For example, Gideon's long robes and purple glowy stuff tells us he's a mage of some sort. Sparrow's royal garment and large bow shows she's a noble archer. Chimera is, uh, scary. Although you may not know the intricacies of the characters, they all give off a surface level amount of foreshadowing just by looking at them. Besides Zinx, no one really falls into that Concord-esque, ugly, undecipherable character designs. Some of my favorite characters to use is Steel, a hulking dude with a shield who wields his fists as weapons in combat. Excellent for either being a tank or going toe to toe with any other character in a duel. Murdoch, who just seems to be the guy who can hit the hardest for some reason. His sniper shot can hit anyone through any object with unlimited range, making him either the most annoying kill stealing teammate or an excellent member who mops up enemies who think they got away from you. I mentioned Gideon earlier, but man, he's a new person's best friend as his abilities hit hard as a truck and he has a blink ability to get him out of trouble when he gets overwhelmed or makes stupid mistakes. You can't really go wrong with any character, but based on your playstyle, you'll definitely find a main couple characters and stick with them. Some characters wildly change the pace of the game and take longer to learn than others, so if you have time, there are potentially hundreds of hours of play here for basically free. Unfortunately, as with all free-to-play games, it comes with the dreaded microtransaction store. I said in my City Skylines video that game developers deserve to make a profit, but just seeing the word store on the homepage doesn't make me feel good at all. However, I am pleased to announce that it really isn't too egregious. Yes, it's there, and the main menu has cool skins shoved right in your face for sale, but after you get past that, it's not too prominent. The grind for characters is definitely a hair on the slow side, depending on who you want, but I find that even the more expensive characters weren't too hard to grind to. Of course they still let you know that you can just buy them and skip the grind. If variety is something that worries you and still don't want to spend money, then the free rotational pool seems to change rapidly enough to keep most players satiated. Every character is also given their own little battle pass for worthless little rewards that they try to sell you. All they are, are just different banners and a little crown that goes on your character that no one will see anyways, so who cares? I was disappointed to see that there wasn't a way to purchase all the characters in a bundle of sort. I know they did that for the beta, and it would have been nice to still have it after version 1.0 came out. I don't know why that feels different to me than a microtransaction, almost as if it's kind of like buying the game and just being done with spending money after that, but nope. Oh well, can't complain when the game is literally free. 
So we talked about some of the characters and the microtransactions, but how is the actual game? Honestly, it's exactly what I remember Paragon being like with an added game mode. There's two main ways to play, the standard MOBA mode and a brawl mode that heavily focuses on PvP combat instead of lane control and pushing. I won't repeat too heavily what I mentioned at the onset, but the standard mode is your classic MOBA. You're assigned a lane, and you push towers and kill the enemy until you defeat their core. One thing I didn't mention is the jungle. Most MOBAs have a type of jungle, these half zones between zones, where usually a player is tasked with running around and clearing preset camps of monsters for experience instead of the lanes that everyone else uses. Some of these jungle camps have bonuses such as ability damage increase, attack speed increase, or giving you a large shield. The idea for the jungler is to collect these upgrades and then ambush the enemies on the lanes, turning 1v1s into 1v2s. These guys play a critical role in the success of a match because a bad jungler can ruin an otherwise perfectly good team. I personally get way too stressed and overwhelmed, but Swanky Pants, who I play with a lot, excels at this role. The other lanes aren't quite as interesting as the jungle, but where Predecessor succeeds is by inviting the lanes to enter the jungle too, by placing relevant buffs near the lanes. For example, mid lane is usually someone who is a glass cannon, like a mage or a sniper. So near them will usually spawn an ability damage increase buff that encourages them to enter the jungle and risk their lane for more rewards. They also get mana back by doing this. Mana is basically a stamina bar. Every ability costs mana and it replenishes at different rates depending on your tactics and equipment. When your mana bar is depleted, you're either forced to be a sitting duck on your lane or retreat to base and regain mana and spend your money on equipment to level up. The mana system is annoying, but serves a good purpose. Without it, a player could conceivably stay on their lane infinitely and make matches slow, grueling slogs where everyone is fully armed all the time, making the jungler's life harder and discouraging spontaneous combat. That's kind of the flow for a lot of characters. You farm minions and chip away at an enemy until their mana and health is relatively depleted, then you pounce whenever your jungler says he's ready to ambush and boom, you've got yourself an easy kill. Obviously there's a lot more to it than that though, as the enemy is doing the same thing to you. Combat as a whole in Predecessor is easily the highlight. Fighting over buffs, lane control, or just straight up team fights are where the characters all shine. These characters are meant to work together and synergize. For example, a Gideon tearing through someone's health while Chimera and Narbash stun them. And if the enemy happens to get away, then Murdoch will finish them off with his laser sniper. It's also fluid, and when you have a good team, it's almost like a dance as everyone works together to work through an enemy force. Of course, if you get a crappy team, then it's quite the opposite. Being locked into a match for 30 minutes with teammates who can't tell up from down and can't count to 5 is so frustrating. I try not to be a negative Nancy anymore, but it's difficult to not start yelling at the screen as your team fumbles the easiest ambush, or that one player is just feeding the enemy. With that being said, Predecessor's biggest weakness is the fact that it's a MOBA. Despite being one of the easier MOBAs to get into, there's a certain culture that surrounds these games, and man, they require a large time sink to be any good at. It's very common to play for two hours and only get three or so matches in and all three of them being stinkers. That's why I find so much magic in the brawl game mode. A very small arena with a fast respawn rate and accelerated money and experience accumulation is so refreshing. Brawl is a mode where combat is the name of the game. Yes, technically there are minions to push, but they basically naturally do what they need to do if you're focusing on the enemies primarily, so you can ignore them. Getting on brawl with a smart group of people all working together in synergy is very heart pounding. I've ended brawl matches sweating before because of how in the zone I was. I truly think that Predecessor has something magical going on with brawl. I wish they would advertise it more. Obviously don't abandon the main game, but at the same time expand and build on brawl mode, and that could genuinely be Predecessor's standout that separates it from its competitors. 
Maybe instead of just buffs on the side of the map, maybe there could be camps that, if you clear, could give your team some more health pickups. Or maybe a friendly turret, or something that you can interact with to change the layout of the map, to create different choke points, or cut off retreat zones. Just spitballing here, but there's so much potential. I hope they don't put Brawl on the back burner. One thing I'm grateful for is there isn't any lore that weighs any of these characters down. I know it's a weird thing to say, but when I play games like League, there's a lot of lore that gets thrown around and some of it's cool, like the TV show Arcane, but a lot of it just gets in the way of why most people are here. I think predecessors should keep the lore to a minimum, and if they do start to include it, maybe just keep it vague and low-key. Of course, I could be in the wrong. Who knows, maybe the next big comic book series could be a predecessor comic or something. In my not-so-professional opinion, I believe predecessor strengths lay heavily in the fast-paced, combat-heavy gameplay and beautiful maps and presentation. The particle effects around your character's abilities, the lush vegetation, the slick design of the towers all blend to this visual feast that I can't get enough of. One other good thing is how fun this game is with friends. I play this game with my brother all the time and it's so much fun to come up with stupid plans and watch them fail miserably or succeed for no good reason other than us just being dorks. Planning and executing tactics and strategies over voice chat with someone automatically puts you at an advantage compared to your opponents as well. The downsides and things I would improve would definitely be the character voice lines. Each character has like one or two sentences for most abilities and you will hear these about a thousand times a match. When your whole game is based around combat, it'd be nice to have a couple more voice lines per character. Including the chat wheel, everyone's chat wheel sounds the same, so you have to visually decipher who is saying what which in the heat of combat will only slow you down. I'm hoping that this gets addressed, as well as the general sound effects and music. None of it is too bad, but there's definitely room for improvement as the music doesn't really stand out, and the sound effects don't hit as well as the competitions. However, if Predecessor keeps doing what it's doing, then Omega could have a hit on their hands. I wish them luck with this project. I mean, they had a $17 million head start, so it'd be painful if they failed like all the rest. I'll definitely recommend this game to anyone looking for a breath of fresh MOBA air, and I will check back on this game every few weeks to see what it has in store for us. For now, I've been Roteburn. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see y'all in the next one.